Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back into the next part of our Anno Ultimate Guide. For this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the World's Fair. We're going to take a look at the Palace from the Seat of Power DLC and just talk about some last minute things to get you going through the last parts of the base game before we start moving into some more advanced different tips. Now, I already have some Ultimate Guides out there for the Arctic region as well as guides on tourist season and different things with that. So we're not going to go into tourist season things or the Arctic. If you are interested in seeing those, those videos will be pinned down in the comments section below. I encourage you to go check them out. They'll give you some good overviews and ideas about how to deal with those regions. So let's get started with the World's Fair. So the World's Fair is the first monument you can build in the base game. It comes at investors, and we talked about it in the last episode about what it takes to actually build it and how many phases there are and all the investors you need to get it up and running, which again, that number is 5,000. Once you have constructed the World's Fair, it is a source for getting a lot of really good items that you might want in your game. If we take a look, there are four categories. Architectural Marvels, Science and Innovation, Archaeology and Ethnography, and Botany and Horticulture. The Botany and Horticulture tab will only be there if you have the Botanica DLC though, so just be aware of that. If you don't have that DLC, this section won't be available to you. Each of these four categories can be selected, and what it does is give you potential rewards. Now when you select it, there are three levels of exhibitions. The ones you can do depend on the number of investors you have in your city. The modest exhibition requires 5,000 investors. That's the basic one. That's the first one you unlock. If you only build this with your 5,000 investors, this is the only one you will have access to. Large exhibitions require 7,500 investors. And the sumptuous exhibition takes 10,000 investors. And they also have a running cost. That is how much it costs you to actually run the exhibition it's not like a per minute cost it's just how much it costs you to actually get it going it's a little the wording's a little off there it's not a running cost over the course of the exhibition itself it's just how much you have to spend to put it on now when you get ready to do a exhibition you will do the preparation phase first so the difference between them are modest exhibitions give you tiers one through five reward chests Large exhibitions are tiers three through seven and sumptuous exhibitions are tiers five through nine. Now that will make a little bit more sense here shortly. Once you choose which one you want to do, there is a preparation phase. Okay. The preparation phase is different for each exhibition. The modest one takes a 20 minute prep time and it will have a Possible goods chosen from these different things. There's always one of each. So there will be a, for the modest exhibition, there will be a need for either potatoes, fish, bread, or sausages, beer or schnapps, fruits such as grapes or plantains, and they always need access to electricity. Large exhibitions, sorry, I cannot say that word, um, take 30 minutes to prepare and they will require things like goulash or canned food, rum or beer, chocolate or plantains, belt or cotton fabric, and again, access to electricity. And then the highest exhibition right here, the sumptuous exhibition, can take tortillas or goulash, champagne or rum, fried plantains, chocolate or coffee, furs or felts, and cigars, gramophones, or penny farthings. And it also, of course, shows you the amount of goods possible at the bottom. Now, you might be noticing something that says investment. What this investment right here means, whatever the base cost of the investors needed for that exhibition, if you double that, then you reduce the number of goods by 50%. Since the modest exhibition has a requirement of 5,000 investors, since I have over 10,000 investors, that means I get a 50% reduction in goods for that. However, over on this one right here, the max investment on the large 
exhibition, since the base is 7,500, the max investment is 15,000 investors. I only have 10,350, so that's giving me a 19% reduction. And over here, the max is 20,000. Since I only have 350 more than the base amount of investors, it only gives me a 1% reduction in goods. So having more investors is always a good thing for your exhibitions. The maximum is 20,000. So honestly, having over 20,000 investors, anything beyond that is just whatever. It's just bonus income and influence for you, basically. There's really no major reason, game mechanics-wise, to have more than 20,000 investors, because that is the maximum amount that you can get with the monuments right here, with the uh, World's Fair right here, rather. So that is how these right here work. So what about the chests? Well, let's take a look first at the modest one. The modest exhibition right here, once we run this one for 20 minutes, then it will have a timer that comes up that will actually be the exhibition itself. All exhibitions last for 10 minutes. So the total time for this is 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and 50 minutes right here, okay? Once that timer is up, then you will get a choice of rewards. Now, if something happens and you don't get all of these goods delivered, then you might not get all of the chests. You'll get access to the chests available to you depending on how many goods you delivered. One very common issue people run into is that they lose access to electricity to their World's Fair at some point right when the preparation phase is ending and they don't get access to the highest tier chest. Losing, if you have everything else delivered, but you lose access to electricity right when the preparation phase is over, over you will not get that final chest you have to have everything met when the preparation phase ends to get access to all the chests and again you can choose from any of the chests now there is a lot of different rewards you can get from the chest and i am not going to go through them all what i'm going to do is provide a link down in the comments section below to the world's fair rewards page where you can go through and see how all the rewards are split up, which chests they come from, and which chests you might want to be aiming for in order to get stuff. There are a lot of different uh, items spread across all of the different chests, especially when it comes to your zoo items from archaeology and ethnography, like your zoo and museum items, and the science and innovation stuff. These two right here are your big ones. These are your trade union items, and these are your museum and zoo items. There's a lot of stuff, some really good stuff spread across, not always the highest tier chest that you might want. So you want to double check and see where the items you're looking for are going to come from from the chests, and then aim for those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a large exhibition, and when I come back, we'll just take a look at the chest and how that actually works. So I'll see you guys in just a second. So actually, this is a good spot right here to jump back in and just show you the preparation phase itself. Didn't think about showing you that, but hey, why not? So as you can see right here, it has chosen canned food, cotton fabric, rum, and chocolate as the resources that this particular exhibition is going to need. I chose a, I chose a large archaeological exhibition, and right now I'm getting 323 possible attractiveness from this exhibition. And down here are the different chests that I can get. I could get buried handcrafts, ancient writings, rich furnitures, noble funerary material, or natural history. I'm aiming for natural history because I'm wanting to get the Jurassic set for the museum. That's what comes from the natural history section. Now, the rewards are random from the chest, so you may have to run this multiple times to get the things you want from it. But all I've got to do now is just sit here and wait for the timer to count down, wait for all of the goods to fill up, and make sure that I keep electricity going so I will have access to the natural history chest. When we come back, the exhibition should be over, and we can see about how to choose the chest. So once you are done with your World's Fair and you have everything finished up with it, you'll get to choose one of these. Now, you don't get to see what's going to be in it. It's a little bit of a loot box kind of thing, but, you know, you get to choose and... It gives you some rewards. Unveil rewards. Let's see what we got. We got a Stegosaurus, a Neanderthal skeleton, and a Protoceratops eggs. Not too bad. I will take it. 
And then all you do is you just keep running exhibitions for whatever you are wanting to get until you have everything you need. That's all the World's Fair is. It is just a simple little mechanic in the background that lets you roll to try and get different items and things that you might want for your trade unions and cultural buildings like zoos and museums and botanical gardens, as well as some fun and unique looking ornaments that you could also get over here as well. Now comes the big question a lot of people always ask, is it worth it? In my opinion, it's an easy background mechanic that you can do to get stuff. So yes, to me, it is worth it. It doesn't take any special stuff going on. You just need to bring over a supply of goods from the new world, such as tortillas, plantains, things like that. Anything that is from the new world that you may not have on this island locally. If you have dock lands, you could import most of that kind of stuff, bring it over from your production islands. However you need to do it, just keep a small supply over here on occasion and you can run these exhibitions in the background. Now, obviously, if you have something like the Land of Lions DLC, this thing right here really loses a lot of its value because you can discover and craft items as well from the Research Institute. But if you don't have Land of Lions, this is a great way to eventually get everything you need. I love running the World's Fair in the background while I'm building and doing other stuff because I'm just not a big fan of crafting items personally. So I like doing it via the World's Fair. So that's the World's Fair. That's all it is. That's all it takes. It's a fun little mechanic if you enjoy doing stuff like that. If you don't, skip it. Find your items a different way in the game. So now let's talk about the palace. The palace is a building that was introduced with the Seat of Power DLC. So if you do not have the Seat of Power DLC, you can go ahead and skip this part. But if you do and you want to learn a little bit about the palace, stick around. So this guy is unlocked when you hit investors. You can build it as soon as you get to investors. It doesn't take anything special. Just one investor and you can build a palace. However, it is very expensive, as you can see. It has a maintenance cost of 5,000. Ignore the maintenance cost of a bus stop because that's specific to the tourism DLC. It does have a 1 million coin construction cost as well, but it does boost the attractiveness of your island by 150. So the way the palace works is it has a road range. It has a fairly sizable radius around it to begin with. Note the word to begin with. And you can place it basically anywhere you want, but typically most people try to place it relatively in the center of their towns, but mostly in the center of the city. That way it gets the most extension as you add on to the palace. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of plot mine. Eh, let's just say right about in here. Now, obviously it's not connected to a road yet, but it will be soon because you get to design your own palace with this thing. How you design the palace is totally up to you. There is no right or, right or wrong way to do it. Some people literally just start plopping down the modules. The modules can be found by clicking this button right up here under Palace Wings. And then there are six different models. And then the uh, straight Palace Wing right here, just the, this, the basic Palace Wing right there, has uh, three models itself. So there's nine total models. Some people just take it and they just start plopping down like this. You can drag them. You can do however you want. Some people just do this and you know what? That's perfectly fine. If you don't really care, just go ahead and pop them down however you want. Now, some people do like to try to make it look, you know, rather nice and interesting. So we'd like to make a nice, pretty design out of it. Or you can start trying to design something elaborate like what I've done here and put parks and all kinds of stuff in it. Whatever you want to do, let your imagination go absolutely wild. It does not matter where the wings on the palace go. When you add the wings onto the palace, as you can see, our range has extended out considerably with our 28 wings, and I still have six more than I can add. And it has extended out quite, quite far. A palace on a large island in the old world, well, once it has about, I would say, around 35-ish, 40, between 35 and 40, somewhere around there. I don't remember the exact number anymore. Somewhere around that number will cover the entire large island. I mean, it may even be a little bit less than that for this particular island. I might be able to get there with a, eh, maybe about 35, actually. Yeah. But anyways, it doesn't matter. What I mean by that is you get more palace wings every time you hit a global population 
increase. It's the same mechanic that's up here with your profile level. You'll get influence and you also get palace wings. You get two additional palace wings every time you reach a global population milestone. So beyond all of that, what does the palace actually do for you? And what is all this range about? Well, it's because of policies. There are five different departments within the palace. The Department of Administration mostly deals with residential stuff and town halls. For every town hall that is within range, that is the green radius of the palace, you get plus 50 workforce per town hall connected. So if you have two town halls, that's 100 workforce for each of the four workforce tiers up here. Investors are not included, by the way. Just be aware of that. If you have 50 town halls, that's 50 town halls, you'll have 2,500 workforce. So yeah, every town hall gets 50 workforce. It's pretty crazy. There are also policies. So we're going to go through each tab and talk about all of that as well. So under the policies for the Department of Administration, there are some interesting policies under here. We have this we have the Seller Repurposing Act and the Creative Cuisine Act that we've already unlocked. The Seller Repurposing Act gives you plus 200 island storage per town hall connected. And the Creative Cuisine Act reduces the need for foods. So fish, sausage, bread, canned food, etc. by 30%. Pretty, pretty nice. Science Fairs Act requires 2,700 island attractiveness, and it gives you plus one influence for all engineer residences surrounded uh, that are within the range of a town hall. That was pretty strong before High Life. It's not as strong anymore, but it's not bad. It is a nice way, if you have a lot of, a lot of engineers going on, to get some influence from them. The Open Minds Act gives you plus one additional sockets in your town halls. This is a very, very strong one right here. Extra item slots in town halls are always very useful. And then the Guild Hall Act gives you 200 attractiveness for each town hall. If you're trying to farm a lot of attractiveness, this is the way to go. So the Department of Culture is next, and it has a departmental effect of giving plus 20% chance of receiving visitor specialists at the public mooring. It's a really, really good one. Getting specialists at the public mooring is basically the reason you have public moorings and increasing the chance of visitors, especially once you hit the legendary specialist threshold is really, really awesome. So definitely try to have your public mooring within range of the palace at all times. As far as policies you can choose, the plus run reward from World's Fair event. If you like running the World's Fair stuff, go ahead and choose this before you start an exhibition. You cannot choose this policy after an exhibition has started. So if you want to run some World's Fair stuff, switch over to this one. This gives you an additional reward from the chest. So instead of three items, you'll get four. So it's really, really cool. The next two right here are kind of just dependent on which one you tend to have the most modules of. Plus 10 influence per museum module or zoo module basically makes them free. It still costs influence to place them. So you still have to have the influence available to place them. But once you place it, you get the 10 influence back. Now, one cool little trick with this is that the first 10 modules you place don't cost influence. So when you place these, you actually gain influence. Instead of it being a net zero gain, the first 10 modules you place will actually gain you influence. So this is a really cool little trick. Like if I go ahead and plop this right here, because I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, we'll see that my influence is going to go up by 60. Boom, right there. Great little way to get some influence from either of those if you need it. The Estate Collections Act is 250 attractiveness per completed cultural set. Again, if you're farming attractiveness and trying to boost that up really high, this is a fantastic one to get. The last one is the Right to Remain Act, and this is typically the one a lot of people uh, recommend using, especially when you're trying to farm specialists. And the VIP specialist pool that it has is really, really unique. I will provide a link to it down in the description below about how it works and everything. I'm not going to get into it here. It's a little it's a little much to talk about, but it does give a particular pool of specialists that it will choose from whenever you get specialists coming to your island. So this is a really ni nice one right here. Again, loses a lot of its value due to the Land of Lions and the Research Institute, 
But if you still want to try to farm specialists from your department mooring, this is a good one down here. Next up is the Department of Labor. The departmental effect is plus 10% productivity for production buildings within range of a trade union. Anything that boosts productivity is a win-win. So awesome little effect. As far as policies, extra goods from farms, it's okay. You get plus one every two cycles. So you get plus one ton. The way this works is not that like a grain farm will give you all of those goods. The grain farm itself will give you one extra grain every two cycles. A vineyard will give you one extra grape every two cycles. So it's not that you'll get all of these from a single building. It is dependent upon what's actually being produced there. So it is a nice little way of getting some extra goods from your farms if you need that. The next one is really, really strong, though, and that is all heavy industries connected to trade unions will get one extra product every three cycles. Now, that is pretty nice. There are a lot of heavy industries, especially in the tourist and skyscraper stuff. There are several heavy industries included with those that you can get additional goods from. So those are really, really strong, and I really, really like those. The Galvanic Grants Act gives you plus 50% productivity from electricity. This is a really good one if you just have a lot of general industry around your trade unions and not specifically heavy factories. So this will just give you a flat bonus. Now, a lot of people love this one, though. Minus 50% workforce needed for all production buildings and multi-factories. People love reducing workforce, and that's a huge strategy, especially for min-maxers and record builders to reduce workforce needed. So this is a very popular one for them. And then the last one is also a very popular one, and that is the plus one socket to trade unions. Again, more items in a trade union is really, really good. Now, the Department of Welfare is an interesting one because a lot of people, there's a little thing about it most people don't know. Plus 10 area of influence for all public buildings includes power plants. Power plants are considered a public building. So this increases the range of, pow of power plants by 10 tiles. A lot of people don't know that and they don't realize that this is affecting it. So your power plants will reach farther with the Department of Welfare on it. So really, really helpful thing right there. If you have the Arctic DLC or the, the Passage DLC, rather, the gas-fired power plants are also public buildings, so it affects those as well. So anything that is considered a public building, those are all the things highlighted here on the screen, are increased tiles by 10 tiles, are increased by 10 area influence. Now, as far as policies, we have the aspirational finance, which gives you bonus income, for artisans and engineers within range of universities, power plants, banks, and variety theaters, it, it, it's okay. I, I'm not a big fan of that one. Now, this one I love for my personal building style. Plus three attractiveness for artisan and engineer residences. That's a biggie for me. That's a big biggie for me. Uh, I like to have a lot of different engineers and artisans mixed into my cities, especially my major capital cities. I think it looks nice. So plus three attractiveness for all of that. It is a massive amount. I believe in one game I had probably four or five thousand attractiveness coming from this right here alone. It was absolutely bonkers how much attractiveness you can get. So really, really good. The Citywide Web Act, the plus 15 area of influence for power plants, is not very strong to me just because of the plus 10 that you're already getting from the base effect. So I wouldn't recommend this one, but if you want to use it, go ahead. Plus five happiness from all public services. Again, one that is situational, not the best thing in the world. Now, the Late License Act is really, really nice. Minus 20% reduced need for all drinks. So that's a big one. Anything that reduces consumption is a massive win-win. And last but not least, we have the Department of Trade. The base effect is plus 200 tons per Harbor Master's office. Now, what that actually means and what it actually does is that any harbor master that is connected by road, be sure you have it connected by a road. It actually adds storage to harbor master's offices or and the Docklands main wharf. So it actually turns them into storage depots and adds 200 to them. It's a great way of boosting island storage. Now, as for policies, we have the Coastal Reforms Act, 300% productivity for all coastal production buildings. Super, super strong right there if you are doing a lot of sand mines and things like that. Very, very powerful effect right there. Shipyard Stock Act, plus 50 tons island storage per depot. This does only affect the base game depots, not the 
Docklands depots, just be aware of that. This is only the base game depots, uh, these things like this right here. It affects these. It does not affect Docklands depots. Fuel Reserves Act, 200 island storage per oil harbor and storage and oil store. Again, if you need the storage, go ahead and get it. Plus one item slot for Harbor Master's offices. Pretty strong right there. Again, anything that adds item slots to a building is really nice. But this one right here beats all. 50% load times for ships at trading posts and piers. Super, super powerful. Uh, loading times can get absolutely bonkers in the late game, especially if you have great Easterns and stuff running around. And they are trying to load or unload tons and tons of goods. This right here reduces the loading times and get your trade routes moving much, much faster. So a really, really strong policy right there. So what else can it do besides that? Well, there's actually even more that this guy can do. If we take a look at the overview screen right here, it shows you a nice overview of where you're at with your attractiveness, what's coming up on the next unlock. It has, it's a very well done screen. I really like how it works. But you'll see right here, there's this thing called prestige level. What is that? Well, Prestige level is a nice little thing that once you reach 9,000 attractiveness, which is after you have unlocked the final uh, policy available, which is the Naval Logistics Act, once you reach 9,000 attractiveness, you will get a prestige level. And what that does is it increases the effect of all of these right here. It starts increasing the effects. For example, the Department of Administration at prestige level one, this goes up to 60 workforce and it adds 10 workforce every prestige level. So at prestige level two, it's 70 and then 80 at three and so on. The Department of Culture adds 4%. So this right here increases 4% for every prestige level. The Department of Labor increases by 2% every prestige level. The Department of Welfare increases by plus two influence range. And the Department of Trade increases by 40 tons of storage per prestige level. So that is how all of these increase. Now, here's the even more fun part. There is a max of 25 prestige levels. You cannot go beyond 33,000 attractiveness, which is how much you need for prestige level five. So let me tell you the numbers at prestige level five, 25. This turns into plus 300 workforce. This turns into plus 120% increased chance of visits. This turns into plus 60% productivity. This is plus 60 range, and this is plus 1,200 tons. So it's super, super powerful. The palace is absolutely awesome. It's a lovely, lovely building. Definitely recommend that DLC if you are looking into uh, getting the most out of your islands. But what about the palace itself? Can I build more of these? Well, unfortunately, no, you can't. You can only have one palace per game. However, you can build this little thing called the local department. Local department is this little guy. He's a lovely little guy. His range is half of the range of the palace itself. So whatever your palace range is, this thing right here will be half. And how it works is it lets you choose a single department for that island. Okay, you can only have one local department per island and you can choose which one you want. Which one you're going to choose is going to be dependent upon that island and what the primary focus of it is. This is an industrial island. However, I don't actually have trade unions here, so it's not really that big of a deal. It's not going to help me much. If I had Harbor Masters on this island, I could do this right here for extra storage. Or I could do this right here to increase the range of my power plants and extend some range around. So local departments are really nice because you can uh, min-max your islands a little bit better and choose some local policies for them. Try to specialize your islands when you can and use the local departments to really good effect for that. So the last thing I want to talk about real quick today is just a particular quest that you will get as soon as you finish building the World's Fair, and that is a floating city a Big Ask. You get this from Archibald Blake. I'm not going to go through the entire quest line right here, but go ahead and do this quest line as soon as you pick it up. It's very, very easy. It doesn't take long. Just make sure you have some steam motors and a couple of other things sitting around, I believe, steel beams sitting around that you can use to give to him. You'll need some. But do that and do this quest 
and you are going to get this little guy. This is the Great Eastern. This is the reward for completing the quest for Sir Archibald Blake. It at one time was a unique legendary ship. It has a very nice high speed to it. It also has eight cargo slots. It is the only ship in the game that has eight cargo slots. It also has three item sockets. Now it is fairly expensive at 1000 upkeep and it does cost about 10 influence. So it is a somewhat expensive ship. But it is an absolute beauty. Now, if you do have the uh, club reward unlocked, there is a heritage skin for it. You can switch the skin around if you want, or you can just go back to the default, whichever one suits your fancy. But the Great Eastern is a lovely, lovely ship. It is the ultimate bulk transport mover. If you have goods that are needed in large amounts later on in the game, you need lots and lots of stuff moved. The Great Eastern is the best one for that. It is also the best ship for expeditions. If you still like doing expeditions in the game and sending your ships off to discover strange new areas and finding goodies from them, from specialists to weapons and all kinds of torpedoes and weird little things like that, then you can send off the Great Eastern with three items and and several specialists ration stocked on there and breeze through those expeditions really, really quickly. Now, unless you have the Land of Lions DLC, this is the only one you get. If you lose it, you can get another one from Archie, although it costs quite a bit of money. But you can get another one if you lose this one. If you have the Land of Lions DLC, the Research Institute allows you to craft a permit which allows you to build one at a time. Each permit is equal to one more ship. So if you want more Great Easterns, you have to research more permits. So you can get these through the Steam Shipyard with the Land of Lions DLC if you have uh, the permits researched. So it is a fantastic ship. Definitely go ahead and get this as soon as you have the World's Fair built and unlocked. And you can start using this for all kinds of fun things. I like to take my initial one and use it for exp expeditions. Especially those really harder three-star ones, I like to send it on those because it can usually blast through those really, really easily. And I think that's going to be it for me today, guys. This did not have nearly as much tips and tricks and playthrough stuff just because there was a few high-level things that I felt like we needed to discuss to get it out of the way so we can start digging into some of the more advanced things that people keep asking me for in the next few episodes. So I hope this helped you out getting through the basic investor stuff. We will be coming back and talking about some more advanced things now later on. I hope you will stay tuned for those and join me for those future episodes. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below. Let me know any thoughts you have about the palace. What are your favorite policies? Uh, what do you like to do with the World's Fair? Do you like having one Great Eastern or a thousand of them? Let me know about all of that stuff. And I will see you guys in the next one. Until then... Take care.